Hey. So we're going to um, have a little bit of a focus on open doors at the end service, a bit of a change round, but um, we're going to get back into Genesis. Anyone enjoying? Thanks, babe. Anyone enjoying Genesis? Yeah. Smiles? Yeah. I hope so. I think it's been fantastic. I think it's been really good. And I don't know about you, but as we've been going through the um, series, it feels like there's been like a momentum building. Uh, I realise that in, um, not everybody comes every week, uh, so you might not have caught every single week. I'd encourage you to come every week because you get more engaged, you get more from it. Uh, the more you put into something, the more you get out of something. That's just true in life. Uh, but as we've been going through the series, it's like this momentum is beginning to build. And even at the beginning of creation and humanity and all these things, we're already getting a sense of the plans and the purposes and the ways of God. And I don't know about you, but my experience is that the more I learn of God, the more I know about Him, the more I connect with Him, experience Him, understand His presence, and the more I fall in love with Him, and I want more of Him. That's been my experience. I don't know about you, but I want to encourage you this morning that if you're sort of paddling around in the shallows of God, and that's cool, that's not a bad thing, that's great, it's better to be there than nowhere, but if you are paddling around in the shallows of God, I want to encourage you to get in deeper, to push in deeper, because the more that you encounter, the more that you get into it, the more alive it becomes, the greater it becomes. And as I prepared the preach um, a few weeks ago, actually, I had a sense that maybe a bit of a word for people who have maybe spent even like a lifetime paddling in the shallows of Jesus. You know, you may have been a Christian your whole life or uh, for a significant amount of your life, but you've only really gone ankle deep, if you're honest. And I don't want that to come across as condemning because it's great to splash around in the shallows, but there's so much more. There's a whole ocean of God that you can encounter. And I want to encourage you. And I believe that God is saying this morning, hey, do you, do you want to do this properly? Should we give this a real go? Should we have a proper go at this together? So I want to encourage you, if that's you, just to respond to God and say, yeah, you know, a little bit what we've been singing, isn't it? I want to press in a bit deeper. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is life transformational. We thank you that you've been speaking for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years through generations after generations. And here we are, little Amber Coat, little us, and yet we become part of this huge story, this huge thing that is happening, this cosmos, this global event. And we get caught up in your story. And as we see and read through the book of Genesis, that becomes even clearer. And we thank you for that. So I pray for every person in this room now that they would see See themselves, Lord God, not just as an individual sat in a seat, um, having living their own life, but as part of the story, the big story, uh, the main event, um, the big movie that is happening, and we all get to be part of that, Lord. So we just thank you for that, in Jesus' name, Amen. Cool. So we're going to do Jacob this morning. Anyone heard of Jacob before? Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And uh, I'm going to read a passage uh, from Genesis 32. So if you want to, I think it's going to come up on the screen. Have we got it on the screen? Yeah, Genesis 32. I'll find it in my Bible because I forgot to before I got up here. Um, and what this is really is an event that happens in Jacob's life. So um, this sort of happens... Uh, sort of middle, to, from the middle towards the end of his life. And if you like, this is sort of uh, a real um, summary or a sort of moment in Jacob's life where he suddenly understands more of who he is. He understands who God is and he encounters God in a, a, a really powerful way. Uh, this is like an apex in his journey. So you know on a movie... Very often in a movie, they'll show you a scene right at the start of the film, uh, but it's like partway through that person's life, but it somehow summarizes their life, and then they go back to the start, and they work out how they're going to get there. Yeah, you see movies like that? We're going to do that, basically. Okay, so this is Genesis 32, beginning at uh, verse 22. 
And this is uh, called Jacob Wrestles with God. The same night he arose and took his two wives, uh, his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. That's the man who's wrestling with him. But Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of his thigh. So let's back up a little bit as we have been doing over Genesis because our aim is to understand the big story of God, the big themes that are coming out right at the beginning uh, of the Bible. And so do you remember we talked about we could look at life existence as a sort of play? Do you remember that? A few weeks ago we talked about this in a number of acts and um, act one being creation. God creates a good world, a wholesome world. He says that it's good. And then he says that it's very good. He creates humankind. He's going to partner with humankind, not just to live in this weird paradise, but to continue creating and build this beautiful, wholesome, good world. Act two is the fall. We get the entrance of wickedness, evil, rebellion against God, turning away from God, the first murder, deceit, all of these things culminating in the flood and then into the Tower of Babel where humankind basically says we can do it on our own, we're going to do it without God. And then we get the beginning of Israel, Act 3. God calls a man called Abraham and God's commitment is to remain faithful to his original plan to work with humanity, despite humanity's failure to work well with him. And he's going to do that through a family. He's going to call a family and he's going to demonstrate to the world what it's like to be with God, to walk with God. And through that family, his blessing, his original blessing that he wanted to bring across the world, is going to come out into the world and be demonstrated in the world. uh, Abraham has a son called Isaac who continues in many ways to fail and not live up to uh, what he needs to do and yet God continues to be faithful. And then we come to Jacob who is Isaac's son. Now there's 12 chapters of Genesis on Jacob so I'm not going to read through them all. That would be uh, an interesting morning uh, but well worth doing. So what I'm going to try and do is summarise the life of Jacob in probably five minutes. Is that okay? So some of you will know this. That's fine. But let me give you a very quick, uh, we go right back to the start. So we've had this big event. He's wrestling with God. He's been, uh, had this moment. But now we're back at the start. And um, what happens at the start is God is speaking over Jacob's life right from the start. His mother is called Rebecca. You heard about Rebecca a couple of weeks ago, if you heard Dave speak. And Rebecca is barren. And that's a common theme that comes up again and again, not only in Genesis, but throughout the Old Testament, that God chooses to work within the heartache, the disappointment, the hurt, and at that time, what was considered shameful, in those places is where God is going to work. In the places of shame, in the places of failure, in the places of disappointment, God is going to begin to work. So Rebecca is barren and Isaac prays and Rebecca becomes pregnant. But there is something going on with the pregnancy. It's a difficult pregnancy. And um, she has twins. Um, 
and uh, it feels like something's not quite right. Rebecca feels like something's not quite right. And some Jewish commentators have suggested that the babies within her womb are fighting. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? Now, it doesn't say that in the Bible, but that's an interesting thought, that there's some conflict. It's an interesting thought that even before birth, there is conflict. There is something inherent in humankind that is a conflict. But the Bible doesn't say that, but that's an interesting thought. Rebecca, as a good, godly woman, goes and inquires of the Lord with this difficult pregnancy. What is happening? And God speaks over the lives of these two children. And he says this in Genesis 25, 23. Two nations are in your womb and two people from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So the babies are born. One comes out red, which is great, with lots of hair, a hairy red baby. And so he's named Esau. And then the second comes out holding onto the heel of the first baby. And he is called Jacob, which means he takes by the heel. And that's an idea that's going to become really critical in Jacob's story and in his journey. So the children grow up, the brothers grow up, the twins grow up. And uh, first of all, Jacob goes and he acquires his older uh, brother's birthright, basically through cooking a meal. Uh, So Esau loves to hunt and goes and does that stuff. Jacob is a bit of a cook. He's good in the kitchen. So he cooks up a meal. Esau comes home. He's shattered. Esau says, give me some of that. And he says, well, if you give me your birthright, I'll give you a meal. And Esau goes, that sound, we'll go with that. And he gives over his birthright. A little bit later, Jacob deceives his father Isaac uh, in collusion with his mother, which is interesting, Good godly woman, still ambitious for her child. A lot to be said for ambitious uh, mothers, but there you go, we'll leave that right now. Um, and they deceive the father as a little, a little plan together. They deceive the father into giving the blessing that was Esau's, meant to be Esau's, to give it to Jacob. So through trickery and deception and really bargaining and, and that kind of thing, um, Jacob gains the birthright and the blessing that would rightly have been given to his older brother, Esau. Now, because of that, fair enough, the brothers are at odds. You can imagine it being a bit of a difficult family. And so Jacob goes away and he goes to see his uncle Laban, who featured a couple of weeks ago, and he has some encounters with God. And then he sees some beautiful women, as men often do. And he sees this woman called Rachel, who's Laban's daughter, and he says, I want to marry Rachel. So he agrees to work seven years that he could acquire her as a wife. Again, culturally, that's very normal in that time. There was this sense of uh, women being more possessions and that kind of stuff. Um, But Laban deceives him. And instead of giving Rachel, he gives his older and less attractive daughter, Leah. Jacob is very angry, but he agrees to work another seven years to gain Rachel as his wife. Understandably, Leah and Rachel are now at odds. They have a difficult relationship, which you can understand again. I'm not sure Leah would have enjoyed being sort of given away. um, And I don't think Rachel enjoys being given away either, actually, when you read through the text. Jacob doesn't massively help the situation because he loves Rachel more than he loves Leah. He clearly favours her. Uh, Rachel, again, has issues with barrenness. Leah has loads of children. Eventually, Rachel has children. Jacob tricks his uncle into getting more wealthy. So he gains wealth and becomes very, very wealthy. Um, And then he ends up putting stuff right with Esau, although that kind of comes a little bit more from Esau. Esau sort of stands out and makes that happen a little bit. And then one of Jacob, or Jacob's got one daughter. She's abused by a man. But Jacob fails really to do anything about it. And so his sons go and kill a load of people in revenge. And then Jacob has, um, we know, 12 sons. We know that. How do we know that? Because we know the songs, don't we, from Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice. Famously wrote about it and has Joseph, who he favours, over the other brothers, causing more division in the family. And then Tim Murray will talk to us about that. Okay. Jacob's life. 12 chapters. Short summary. And the question we've got to ask really is like, what could we possibly learn from all of that? 
What does any of that have to do with living a Christian life today? And one of the arguments that sometimes levelled against Christianity is that, you know, these were just made up stories that somebody invented to sort of create a religion. But I don't know about you, but when I read these stories, I sort of think those aren't the kind of stories you would make up if you wanted to gauge people into a religion, was it? You know what I mean? That's not an engaging hero in the story, is it really? When you look at how Jacob lived, you're not really getting off to a good start. But these are the people, we say, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It's like we hold them up as these heroes. But when you look at the life, it's a bit mad, isn't it? To me, this sounds quite realistic. Having been around on the earth a little bit, this sounds like real life. I don't know about you, I don't know how many people in this room are part of a broken family, a dysfunctional family, a family that has deception in it, disagreement in it, arguments in it, lies in it, cheating, awkwardness, difficulties. Anybody part of a family like that? Yeah, yeah, there's a few hands going up and the rest of you, it's you, you're the problem. No, no. So... That is just, the truth is, as we look through, if you're in a broken family, you're in great company when you come to the Bible. It's just the reality. And so we see all of this, but what we see is a continuation of the themes that we've been seeing up to this point. Despite the mess, despite the failure, despite the deception, despite all these things, God continues to pursue his connection and his relationship with humanity. And he will not let go of his faithfulness to his plan and his connection with humanity. Firstly to humanity, but then to Abraham to take this family and work with this family despite the brokenness and the dysfunctionality. Though they will not and possibly cannot love him as they should, he will love them and continue to work with them. And I think this is like, God works with very broken tools, do you think? Um, Liz will tell you I'm not very good at DIY. Not very good at all. I tried for a bit and I've sort of given up again. Uh, But I think the most angry Liz has ever seen me was in a DIY project. I don't know if you remember it. I was trying to connect the dishwasher, which isn't a hard job, I don't think. But um, I had to connect this tube onto this pipe thing. Uh, I was YouTubing it as you do. And I literally, it took me ages. I was getting this tube onto this pipe and twisting it. My hands were like red raw with it. And after a while, I managed to get it on to the pipe. So I thought, yes. And then I realized that I had the nut that meant to be on the pipe in my hand over here, which meant I had to get a tube that basically you can't get off, off, put the nut back on and put it back on. I'm not exaggerating. I said I jumped up and down in anger. I literally jumped up and down. And obviously I'm quite tall, so I hit my head on the, uh, yeah, on the doorway. It was funny, wasn't it? After. It wasn't funny at the time. Really, really angry. But if you're good at DIY, which many of you are, bless you. Come and do some jobs at my house. Um, you'll know that working with a good tool is critical, isn't it? Picking the right tool for the right job is critical. However, it seems that God is perfectly content throughout Genesis, throughout the Bible, and seemingly into the rest of the the life that we live to work with very imperfect tools. And it isn't because God is stupid or he doesn't know what to do, but it's because he loves mankind and he loves the covenant that he's made and he will remain faithful to it despite the tool's brokenness. I don't know whether many people here, whether you'd class yourself as a perfect tool for God's purposes. Anyone who put that, oh, I'm a great tool for God's purposes, I'm perfect. Anyone going to, no, you know that you're, Jacob is clearly a very broken tool. He's doing things that really you think, why are you doing that? And the fact is that you're a very broken tool as well in God's hands. So am I. Most of us are not only sort of difficult for God to use in his plans, we're downright dangerous against his plans. We're working against what he's doing most of the time. And yet, and yet God's great love, his great faithfulness, 
his commitment to us, but not only to us, but to his word and what he has said means that he will take broken tools like you and like me and like Jacob and like Isaac and like Abraham, and he will bring his good and his perfect plan through those tools. So if you ever look at Jacob, which I haven't thought, God, why did you pick him? It makes me think, God, why did you pick me? Why did you pick us? So what can we learn from Jacob's life? Well, I think there's loads of things we could learn as ever. We could do a study. We could do 12 weeks just on Jacob. But let's look at two things. Number one, God will work out his plan despite human failure. And number two, our failure to trust still causes harm and pain. So firstly, God will work out his plan despite human failure. Genesis 25, 21 to 23 that we've already read speaks of God choosing Jacob before he was even born. And so though we might see that in some ways, we might see that as unfair, we think, well, God, why why would you choose Jacob over Esau? That seems a bit unfair. But the reality is that there's no one that is justified to be chosen. No one. Jacob or Esau, or in fact, not you, not the Pope, not me, not Paul, not Peter. No one is worthy of being chosen. So when God chooses someone, It is an unworthy person, regardless of who it is. And so God, in his grace and his mercy, chooses Jacob. And that is the word that is hanging over his life. It says, the the older will serve the younger. And what that means, it's more than just like he's going to be the boss. What that means in the economy of God is that God's plan that he's spoken to Abraham, this plan that we've been learning about, that he's developing and growing all the way through Genesis and will develop through, that's going to come through Jacob's line, not through Esau's line, okay? So it's a big deal. And that is contrary to the custom at the time. At the time, the older brother would inherit everything. They would get the birthright and it would be, it's not just about money and possessions, although it is, that's sort of how we see it now, but it's about you're responsible for carrying on the line of that family and for keeping it going and keeping it strong and holding it. Against custom, God is going to choose the lesser one, the younger brother, the one no one expects, and he's going to bring his purposes through his life. And yet, despite this promise over Jacob's life, Jacob, and as we've said, his mother, consistently cheats, lies, and hustles for what he has already spoken over him. And that is some of the story of Jacob's life. His name, Jacob, means heel catcher, as we've said. And that's the idea of a trickster or a con man, a scoundrel or a rascal. Any any rascals in the building? A few rascals here. And we see that play out in his life. And he hustles for, for J, uh, Esau's birthright. He lies to his father. He deceives his father for blessing. He works seven years to purchase his preferred beautiful wife. He swindles his uncle so that he can become richer than him. Jacob is like constantly wheeling and dealing to get the things and to obtain the things that God in reality has already from before birth spoken over his life and promised over his life. And I don't want to steal Tim Murray's thunder um, as he speaks on Joseph in a couple of weeks, but I want to quickly quote Genesis 50, 19 to 21, because there's a a significant passage there that in some ways I think summarizes the whole of Genesis in some ways, but it helps us to understand this idea of how God works with us. And the context, again, if you've seen the musical, I love the musical, um, you'll know that Joseph, um, Jacob's son, gets sold into slavery. His brothers are really bad. They've done that. He's gone off to slavery. Then they find out who he is and they come and he's saved them because of his position that God's positioned him in. Uh, And everything goes well. But then Jacob dies. So we're at this end of the story now. Jacob dies. And basically, Joseph's brothers are a bit panicked because they think, okay, Joseph's been kind to us, but 
But maybe that's just because Jacob's alive and he doesn't want to upset his dad. So we're a bit unsure. And they come to Joseph. And Joseph turns to them and says this, incredible words. He says, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Isn't that incredible? Don't you think that's amazing? The whole of the story of Genesis could be summed up in that. You meant it for evil, but God is going to move it and work it for good. And what that means is what God's going to do, he's going to take all of Jacob's failure, all of his deceit, all of his wrong decisions, all of his life the way he lives, all of his choices, and he's going to gather them up like this, all of that wrong, and he's going to turn it around and he's going to work his good and his perfect plan through that. Aren't you in awe of God? How do you take trickery and deception and turn it for good? How do you take deceit? How do you take these things and turn them for good? But that is what God's going to do. He's going to bless humanity through this person. And that's why we can say, Paul says this, doesn't he? And we've sung some of these words. He says in Romans 8, And we know that for those who love God, all things, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Paul can say that because he knows his Bible. He knows his Old Testament, if you like. He knows the story of Jacob and he sees that despite Jacob's wheeling and dealing and trying to work this way and that way and make this happen and make that happen, despite all that, God is going to take that and he's going to bring his good and his perfect plan through it. He's not going to say, well, you failed So I'm going to go and start a different plan over here and forget you. He's not going to do that. He's going to take that and make it his good and perfect plan. Joseph says that many people should be kept alive. That's talking about that blessing of God into the world. Doesn't that give you confidence? That give you encouragement and confidence in the plans and will of God. Despite even your worst sin. Even your complete lack of following God's ways and his goodness, God's going to gather that up, he's going to work with it, and he's going to turn it into his plan. Isn't that incredible? And it give you a real reassurance that, man, though I fail, though I don't hit the mark, though I'm not good enough, though I can't do what God wants, though I constantly let him down, he's going to gather it up and he's going to bring his perfect plan and his good plan through it. This should be a huge encouragement for us. This is why we can say, if God is for us, who can be against us? These words depend on God's commitment to his plan, his faithfulness and his covenant. That's the encouraging part. The challenge comes really the other side of the coin of this story, which is that yes, God's purposes will be done. His good and perfect plan will come about. However, when we don't live as God calls us, there are consequences that cause pain and suffering and harm. Just in Genesis, we have murder, blaming, arguments, probably divorce, separation, deception, jealousy, trickery, rivalry, hatred, all within the family. Sound familiar? And all of this causes actual pain and actual harm in the world. And though God's plan will continue, God will remain faithful. He'll stick in there. He's not giving up. He will remain faithful to that family. The Bible doesn't shy away from the consequences of the lack of trust in God and the rebellion against God. The sin will cause destruction. And that's why Paul writes what he writes before, but he also writes this in Romans 6. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law 
but under grace. That is spoken to Christians. That's spoken to you and to me. It's not people who aren't saved. It's talking to people who know God. And it's saying, now that you know God, now you're under grace, don't present your life to sinful and rebellious ways. Stop doing that. Why? Is it because you, you, know, you won't be saved? Is it because it's going to stop God's plan? No, it's because those things cause actual harm and actual pain in the world. They are destructive in the world. And our failure to trust God may not stop his plan. He will still bring goodness. He will still bring blessing. But they will cause pain, destruction and harm. And we see this every day, don't we, in our world? I don't need to tell you about this. We see it in the big ways, through war and through abuse and through famine and through those. But we also see it through the small things, don't we? In the way that we treat each other, in jealousy, in envy, in talking behind other people's backs. We see that this walking away from God's ways causes pain and harm and difficulty. And so we come really back to where we started at the beginning. Jacob wrestling and encountering God. Uh, He wrestles what the Bible calls uh, a man or an angel, but it seems to be quite certain that this is God himself in some way wrestling with Jacob. Jacob amazingly seems to be winning. He's obviously quite tough. Seems to be getting on the, the positive side and then God uses his sort of, he's always got a car, doesn't he? And just touches his hip and takes it out of socket and it's kind of over at that point. So God begins to win. God always seems to win, doesn't he? He always has that card up his sleeve. And he says, let me go. God says, let me go. But Jacob grips on to God. He holds on to him. And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And then we have this incredible exchange where God renames the heel catcher, the rascal, the the scoundrel. He renames him from Jacob to Israel. And there's a lot of, um, you'll know probably names are really important in the Bible. Uh, And uh, the word for name, which is pronounced shame in this passage, it's repeated again and again and again in this passage. And that's a way of the author sort of saying, here's a key point, here's a key point. Name is important, name is important. And the name he gives him is Israel. And uh, if you want to go on a little bit of a sort of uh, research uh, rabbit trail, there's a great rabbit trail around what this name actually means. Does it mean this? Does it mean that? Um, But the passage seems to interpret it as he who wrestles with God. Israel, he who strives with God. There's another interpretation, which I really like actually, which is God, the mighty one, persists, rules, shines forth or contends. And that sense is actually it's God who wrestles with us. God's trying to wrestle us into his goodness and his blessing. I like that. Um, But either way, the clear message is, is that Jacob and God are wrestling. They're wrestling together. And out of this, God is working to bring his blessing and his life. Where Jacob in the past has been hustling and wrestling to try and get what God had already promised him. At this point, he sort of comes to himself. He realises who he is. He realises who God is. He wrestles and holds on to God and says, I'm not moving on. I'm not just getting on with things until I get that blessing that you have promised me. So what about us? What about us? We can be harsh, I think, on Jacob and Esau and Cain. We have to remember they don't they didn't have the Bible. <laughs> They didn't have scriptures written down that they sort of could rely on. They're just going through life, just trying to work out what madness this is all about. They're just living. But the fact is, we do have the scriptures. We do have the words of God given to us, the promises of God, the testimony, not only of the Old Testament, but also of the New Testament. So I want to challenge you this morning. Do you know the promises that have been spoken over your life? Do you know them? Let me give you a few. I don't know if we've got them. I can't remember. Did we have them on the screen? I can't remember. 
Yeah, we've got some. Brilliant. God's perfect and unrelenting love for you. I won't go into the scriptures because we ain't got time. But God's unrelenting, determined, huge, passionate love for you that nothing in this world, we did this at the start, can separate you from. God gives you the promise of peace, the promise of hope, the promise of purpose and meaning. He says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand. He's got things ready for us to do. And of course, eternal life itself, knowing God, eternal life. There's plenty of more I could go into, but life, love, purpose, meaning, peace, hope. Those are promises that are spoken over your life and over my life. And how many of us, if we're honest, spend our lives wheeling and dealing and jostling and wrestling to try and get those things our own way? Love, we look to relationships that aren't good in God's plan. Peace, we become obsessed with material things with security, with insurance for this and insurance for that and guarantees on this and guarantees on that, trying to help us get this sense of peace that we can't seem to grasp. Life itself, eternal life, what our experiences, holidays, trying to fill in that gap that we feel. We spend our life trying to hustle and get the things that God has already spoken over our lives. And that's the question I was to go away with. Why don't the band come up? Because I think we're going to sing one song uh, as we close before we go into our open door slot. But in what ways are you trying to wheel and deal to get the blessing that God has already given you in Christ? Just like Jacob, this isn't about you being perfect. It's not about you having it all together. He wasn't and neither do you need to be. But if we humble ourselves and we seek blessing, not through our own actions, but through God himself, then we become Israel. We become he who wrestles with God, he who contends with God and God contends with us because that is who we are really, isn't it? A people wrestling with God. And at that point, God will take hold of you just like he took hold of Jacob. And I think there's gonna be a bit of a struggle as he pulls some of the selfishness out of us, some of the self-centeredness out of us, some of the small-mindedness, the wheeler dealer ways that we have. He pulls that out in that wrestle. But then he comes and he blesses us with all of the promises that he has for us. So Father God, your word says that you've spoken these things over our lives. Blessing, peace, hope, life, meaning, purpose. These things are ours in you, God. But if we're honest, Father, just like Jacob, so many of us spend our lives trying to acquire these things through our own strength, through our own ability, through our own ingenuity. But Father, may we too become Israel. May we become he who wrestles with God. Father God, may you turn this group of people here at Amblecote into a group of people that will not let you go. Not a perfect people, not a people who have everything together, but a people who will grip onto you and say, I will not let you go until you bring your kingdom plans and purposes through me.